welcome to the 340th presentation of the Wonders of Physics. I'm Mark Erickson. I'm the chair of the Department of Physics. And as you probably know, Professor Spratt has been leading the Wonders of Physics for 40 years. That was my reaction when I found out also. But then I started to hear rumors, whispering, discussion of the fact that there were jokes in the show. There was fooling around in the show. There were shenanigans inside the show itself. I wasn't sure, so I decided to investigate. And this is what I found. I discovered that Professor Spratt took our former chancellor, Jana Shalala, placed her inside a Faraday cage and attempted to electrocute her with a million volt Tesla coil. You may be thinking, well, okay. <laughs> What's a million volts? But it didn't stop there. Professor Spratt wanted to go back in time to see his very first show. He built a time machine to go back in time to see that show. But he went too far back, and he found a younger version of himself. Hold on a sec, Jake. I gotta go grab a wrench. I'll be right back. Excuse me? Who are you? Why, I'm Clint Sprott. Who are You're you? not Clint Sprott. I'm Clint Sprott. You can't be Clint Sprott. I'm obviously the handsome devil, Clint Sprott. Well, you are pretty handsome, but uh, what is this thing? Oh, this is a ham radio that I've been working on in the garage. And if you're really Clint Sprott, then maybe you can show me how to fix it. Hmm. You know, that does look like something I built about 40 years ago. You know, I think if you turn the Zener diode around, the capacitor would charge just fine and it would work. Oh, really? But how did you know? Ah, oh, never mind. Well, you know, I think it would do you some good if you would uh, stay around for a little while. You might learn some physics that would be useful to you later in life. <laughs> well, I'd love to, but I'm due at Hamfest in half an hour, so I'd best be off. As you can see, things kept getting worse, and it was probably inevitable that sooner or later, Professor Sprott would be arrested for breaking the laws of physics. Now, Professor Sprott has been accused of breaking the laws of physics, and we intend on putting him on trial for his crimes today. Bring me Professor Sprott. <laughs> Welcome to the wonders of physics. Now, I have been accused of breaking the laws of physics, but it isn't true. And I've asked some of my trusted assistants to come and serve as expert witnesses. And I would like you to be the jury and decide whether I'm innocent or guilty. OK, so I'm sure all of us would like to be able to choose our own jury. But the physics department has made a decision. Professor Sprott has got to go. And so starting today, we are going to begin interviewing candidates you're going to help us and they're going to audition right in front of all of you. <laughs> These are gonna be serious candidates with a proper sense of decorum. <laughs> something appropriate for this fall. Our first candidate is Mike Randall. <laughs> Goodbye, Professor Sprott! I decided to honor Professor Spot today by wearing a top hat and tails. <laughs> uh, this is the closest outfit that I have. So to start it with, let me give you a definition of physics. Let me give you my definition of physics, okay? Physics is the study of stuff. Uh, stuff, like uh, this floor is made out of stuff. The, this room is made out of stuff. You're made out of stuff. But scientists have a different word for everything. Scientists don't call stuff stuff. Scientists call stuff matter. So on the count of three, I want you to all say it with me. One, two, three. Matter. matter. 
so physics is a study of matter, like, uh, like this ball. But wait, there's more. Physics is also the study of how you move stuff around. What gives you the ability to move stuff around? It's a one word answer, starts with the letter E. Just shout it out. Energy. Energy, very good. Energy is the ability to do work. Energy is the ability to do anything. So physics is the study of matter and energy and how those two things play with each other, how they interact. Now this covers a lot of different things. It covers movement, like throwing a ball. It also covers sound you can hear, light you can see, heat you can feel, electricity, magnetism, and then a whole bunch of other stuff lumped together in a category called modern physics. Now, you all know that if you want to get something moving, you have to give it a push or a pull, right? Now, physicists would call that push or a pull a force. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to need a helper from the audience. Let's see. How about you right there in the end? Yep. Come on down here. No, no, I already got one. This one here. Don't worry, there'll be other chances. Don't worry. Hi, what's your name? Hi, Talia. Talia? Yes. Did I say that right? Okay, Talia, I need you to sit on this like you're going to sit on a bicycle, and that's the front wheel right there. Very good. Excellent. So we just said that if you want to get something moving, you got to give it a push or pull, right? So if you push against my hand, something should move, right? Let's try it. Mm hmm. Nothing moving. Hmm. Well, the only way that if that's the only way that could be possible is if something else is pushing in the opposite dire direction from the direction you're pushing in. And there is it's that other push is called a force, or sorry, sorry, it's called friction. Friction is the force. That things, when things are touching, it makes them stick together. So right now, Talia, that round board that you're sitting on, there's a lot of friction between that round board and the floor. The good news is, is that we can get rid of that friction. That is no ordinary board. That is a hovercraft. There's a leaf floor there. When I turn it on, it's going to put air underneath the board, and it's going to lift the board and you a tiny little bit, but enough that all that friction just goes away. Let's try it again. OK, so here we go. All right, well done. Let's give her a big round of applause. So let's talk about uh, energy. There are many different forms of energy. Several of my favorite forms of energy could be found inside of explosions. <laughs> See that red balloon back here? What do you think's inside that balloon? Helium? Hydrogen. That's hydrogen. The lightest element, it also burns really fast if you light it on fire. So when I light this on fire, it's going to make a really loud kaboom. So if you don't like loud sounds, you might want to cover your ears. Now I'll give you a countdown. I'll give you a countdown. OK, ready? And in five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> So did you notice, did you notice there were several different kinds of energy? There was light you could see, there was heat you might have felt on your face, there certainly was a lot of sound energy, right? Another one of my favorite kinds of energy is electricity. Now a lot of people, we all love electricity, a lot of people don't understand what it is though, and it's really pretty simple. All that electricity is, is the movement energy of little teeny tiny things called electrons. OK, that's pretty easy. Now, how do you get them moving? Well, there's several different ways to get them moving. One of, uh, is something that I know you're all familiar with, especially this time of year when the air is dry. Have you ever rubbed your feet on the carpet and then reached towards something metal like a doorknob? Zap! A spark jumps off. It's called static electricity, right? What you may not realize is what you're really doing is you're rubbing your feet on the carpet. You're actually scraping electrons off the carpet and onto your body. 
Now they're trapped there, unless you reach towards something metal, then they jump off, zap, and that makes the spark that you see. Now I have a machine that does this for me. It's right over here. This is called a Van de Graaff generator. And it looks like this. Oh, it looks like a little baby lightning, right? And that sound you hear might be a baby version of thunder. Now this is quite harmless. It stings a little bit. We're not going to hurt you. But real lightning is made in a very similar way. Now you all know that if you see real lightning or hear real thunder, you should get indoors quick because that's really dangerous. But this won't harm anyone. In fact, we're going to use this to do something quite special here. And I need a couple of volunteers to help me with this one. Special instructions. One of you has to have long, straight hair that's not all tied up. Long, straight hair that's not all tied up. Uh, let's see here. Oh, there's so many good choices here. How about right there? You, you. And now I need somebody else. It doesn't matter what your hair is like, anybody at all. How about you right here in the end, sir? What is your name? My name is Rashid. Rashid. Rashid, you stand right here. And you are? Alex. Alex. Rashid and Alex. So Alex, come over here. I'm going to have you put your glasses right there, Alex. And then I'm going to have you come around behind here and climb all the way to the top. Okay. And yep. You can lean on my hands. Now, I'm going to have you sc scoot over, scoot your feet sideways as far as I'll go that way. Nope. Get to turn, face the audience. There you go, perfect. Now put your hand right up here. And keep your hand there till I tell you to. Okay. Now Alex, the really cool part about this is I'm about to give you superpowers. So my hair's gonna stand up? Just, oh, just as a beginning. <laughs> okay, so I'll shake your hair out for us, please. Shake, 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 shake. Okay, that's good. You guys see what's happening? I'm grabbing a mirror here so, Alex, you can see what's it's happening exploding. here. Yep. It's exactly what so, I wanted. So, <laughs> who wouldn't? So here's what's going on. Right now, you are covered in those little electrons. Electrons are over every part of your body and every hair on your head. Now, electrons have a negative electric charge. Think of it like a, like a little force field. If you put two electrons next to each other, they push apart and carry the hair with them. So the electrons on this hair try to get, the, get away from the ones on this hair. As they push apart, it makes the hair st sticky outy like that. That's a technical term. <laughs> now that's not the superpower. Okay. No, you gotta stay there. We're not done, we're just getting started here. <laughs> so, okay, Rashid, there's where you come in. You stand right here. Okay, Alex, with your free hand, make a tight fist. Put one finger out, point it at Rashid's nose. Come in a little bit closer. Okay, can you feel that? Uh, let me take that yeah. Can you feel that? Ow. <laughs> That's another superpower. We'll talk about that in a second. Keep pointing, keep pointing. I'm not done. Okay, you can feel it, right? Ow, yeah. Can you hear it? Yeah. <laughs> you can hear a little hissing sound, right? You might even smell some ozone. Alex is shooting an energy beam into your face right now. <laughs> No, keep pointing, keep pointing. <laughs> you feel it. Now here's what's going on. Those electrons are jumping off the end of your finger onto the air atoms, making the air atoms electric. Those electric air atoms are called ions. Those ions, no, nope, keep going. Those ions fly away from your finger and hit you in the face as wind. That's what you're feeling in your face. But it's an energy beam. Give me a, keep pointing. Give me a knuckle bump right now. Something, oh, we got a little bit of a spark there, right? So it's actually sending those electrons to you and then you send them to me. Or this is another superpower. So shooting energy beams off your finger is a genuine superpower. You have a second superpower, dance control. He's getting shocked through the soles of his feet. So as you're pointing at him, you can make him dance. <laughs> All right, Rashid, that's great. You can now sit down. Let's give him a big round of applause. Alex, you stay right there. You can stand down. Now, I think you have another superpower too. So point out at the audience with your finger. Now do this with your finger. Curl it in and out. Watch his hair. Uh-huh. You have hair control. You totally have hair. Let me bring this mirror up again so you can see it. So keep doing I that with your finger. I see it because yeah. it's my face. I know. <laughs> so you have hair control. That is another superpower. So we actually gave you three superpowers today. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Now, you can put that, that arm down, but keep the other one on the ball there. OK, now you can take your hand off that ball. Now watch this. Your hair is still sticky outy. Yeah. so technical term. The reason why is you're standing on a plastic ladder. 
Electrons have a hard time moving through materials like plastic. It's called an electrical insulator. So as long as you're standing on that ladder, the electrons are still trapped on you. And your hair is still sticky out. Technical term. Now, I want you to jump down. Boop, and down comes your hair. Why? Electrons' favorite place to go is into the ground. So as soon as your feet hit the floor, zoop, down went the electrons, down came your hair, and I'm sorry the superpowers went with. But you did a great job. Make sure you grab your glasses. Excellent job. Mr. Randall, that was very impressive. However, the Department of Physics has not forgotten about that time when you set Peter Weix's beard on fire <laughs> with your rocket demonstration. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this rocket is powered by ethanol. It's a little bit of ethanol in here. I'm going to shake it up a little bit. OK. I'll set Are it up. Are you sure this is safe? It's safe for me. Uh, I'm out of here. You're on your own. We chased off the Klingon. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Of course, Professor Sprott occasionally had his own adventures with rockets. I have invited Professor Sprott to come to Mars and visit us and show us some of his wonderful demonstrations. And if you look up in the sky, you can see him approaching now. Our next candidate to audition will be Emeritus Professor of Physics, Michael Winokur. Thank you, Professor Erickson. Oh, it is so nice to be back here. In fact, I even wore my best tuxedo, just like Professor Sprott. It is the 40th anniversary. And in honor of Valentine's Day, a new hat. And finally, a special treat. One of my surviving former students is here to assist me. <laughs> Akiri, would you please come out here and join us? Yes, I would love to. Hello, everyone. Uh, you look spectacular. Thank you. But I think he could use a hat. And oh. I happen to have a matching hat just for you. I love it. What do you all think? Does it work? Thank you. Well, for our audition today, we've put together a list of some of Professor Sprott's favorite demonstrations. The first one has a number of important physics principles, the most important, though, being density. Or, in the words just mentioned by Mike Randall, the amount of stuff or matter contained in a particular volume. We have here two balloons filled with gases of different densities. One of the gases is helium, and the other is air. Do you think you can tell which is which? Just shout it out. Which gas do you think this is? Air. And what about this one? Air. Very good. Excellent. So, less stuff or matter in a fixed volume means lower density. And if that low density stuff is in a higher density surrounding like air on the surface of the Earth, then because of gravity, and gravitational forces, there will be a net buoyant force upwards, and so the balloon floats. Now, helium isn't all that exciting of a gas, but another gas, you may have heard of it, methane, or natural gas, is also less buoyant than air, and it floats as well. Yeah, and rather than balloons, I find floating methane bubbles to be far more interesting especially if we light them on fire. Would you all like to see that? Yeah. All right. So we just have to turn on our little gas supply. 
and watch the lovely bubbles as they <coughs> come up and out through. They'll start peeking at the top. There it comes. There they are. Now, methane has different chemical properties than helium or air. Methane is highly flammable, and burning methane involves very important physics principles. Uh, they're a little too complicated to go into now, but they mostly involve thermodynamics. Should we just show you? Yeah. All right, let's just, let's just see. Takes a while. There's our snake. It's getting bigger. This is going to be a good one. There we go. Let's move it along. Would you like to see that again? Yeah. All right, let's do it again. Hope you get a nice long one again. And here we go. That was fun. Well, now we have a demonstration that combines buoyancy with another physical property of swirling fluids or vert vortex motion. Now, vortices are an everyday occurrence. I suppose many of you live in a house. Yeah. Sounds about right. Well, have you ever noticed the swirling water that goes down the sink or the bathtub? You just saw a vortex. Now, in the air, there are vortices of w as well, but they are rather hard to see. Unless, of course, they're really, really strong, and they reach down to the ground, and then they can pick up dust or dirt, or in Wisconsin, cows or other matter. And then, well, tornadoes and hurricanes are famous examples of vortices. Now, hot air is less dense than cold air, and so it rises much like the methane bubbles did. A great example of this are hot air balloons. Now, using soil in motion and the heat from burning lighter fluid, we will create our very own tornado, a fire tornado. Now, using the rising heat, as Professor, as Professor Winnicott spins the screen, that will start a vortex. That draws in fresh, cold air from the bottom, and as it heats up and rises, well, things can really take off. Let's see. How about that? Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, well, we're up in the Northern Hemisphere, so that's what it looks like rotating this way. But what if we were in the Southern Hemisphere and it rotated the opposite direction? What would it look like then? Do you want to see? Yeah. Huh, go bigger. <laughs> now, there are fire tornadoes in nature as well, but they can be extremely destructive. Now, for a bit of a different twist, shifting gears, we have an electrifying demonstration that uses electricity and a device called a capacitor in this orange box here. Now, capacitors store energy and electrical charges, but they are not batteries. Batteries store their energy through chemical processes. On the other hand, capacitors store energy just because of their geometry. Two metal plates held very close together, but not touching, and the fact that there are two types of electrical charges, positive and negative, that attract one another very, very strongly. Now, capacitors can provide their power much more quickly than batteries. That is, if we provide a conductive path for the charges to neutralize. To do that, we would use this thin strip of aluminum foil. Using this power supply, I will slowly charge the capacitor by pressing this button. As the capacitor, when the capacitor is fully charged, or when it hits about 50 on this meter, I will release the button, and that will cause the capacitor to very quickly discharge our very own lightning strike. Would you all help me count down from three? Three, two, one. Remember to cover your ears. Oh, wow. Finally, it's a chance to talk about force, force, and area. I want to show off my ever so relaxing bed of nails. 
it's the, just the thing I need when I want to take a nap. You know, that's what happens when you become an emeritus professor. Just ask Professor Sprott. You know what I'm wondering? What if Professor Winnicott was to take his nap on a bed made of just a single nail? Uh, what do you all think of that? I don't think so. No? Lots of force, not much area. Yeah. Uh, but with a bed of nails, uh, we can spread that force over many nails, and it will be perfectly comfortable. Oh, uh, thank you, Professor Ashton. Would you like to take off your new fancy tuxedo before? It's red. In case there's a problem, I think I'll leave it on. Nobody will notice. Hmm. You know, so I don't get cold, we even have a blanket of nails. There we go. There. Now, um, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> so Carrie is going to show off and put a cinder block on top of the blanket and split it with a sledgehammer. Now, it's very important that you do not try this at home. I am a trained professional. All right, you guys ready to see this? Let's do it. Oh. Put some force into I, it. I didn't have my oatmeal this morning. Let's try it again. Oh. Oh, my back. It never felt so good. Oh, that's good. Oh. 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 I finally got to put the squeeze on Professor Whitaker. Uh, I think we have some catching up to do. Well, those were some excellent demonstrations. But those costumes, I'm not sure. <laughs> they may have even been worse than some of Professor Sprott's over the years. <laughs> Our next candidate to audition is Mr. Terry Craney. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Erickson. Yes, I'm here to audition for Professor Sprott's position. I am the most qualified candidate here. And I also have the endorsement of the National Steampunk, Retired Physics Professors, Humorous Puns Association. That is the NSPR PPHPA organization. <laughs> Even Professor Sprott never had their endorsement. Mr. Craney, is it possible he never had their endorsement because there is no such organization? Uh, yes, there is an organization. There's one member, me. Um, <laughs> I'm the president, and I'm also chair of the endorsement committee. <laughs> Mr. Craney, I think you're wasting our time. I, OK, OK. Speaking of time, though, did you hear about the very hungry time traveler that was at the local buffet restaurant? She went back four seconds. <laughs> four seconds. <laughs> rough, rough audience. Okay, so let's do some, uh, some demonstrations, some basic demonstrations that we've done over the years that I've done and Professor Sprott has done. Um, I do them as well as Professor Sprott. My jokes are funnier, as you can tell. Okay, so let's start out here. What I have here is this a piece of copper coil. Just standard copper. Copper is kind of an interesting material that has two properties. One is that it's normally not magnetic. If I take this magnet here and put by the copper, it, it doesn't attract. But copper is a very good conductor of electricity. That means it can move electrons from one copper atom to the next, to the next, to the next, without much resistance. And we can pre produce a current. Well, one way of producing a current is simply take this bar magnet, standard kid's magnet, you might say, and I'm going to insert it into this copper coil. And watch what happens on this galvanometer up here, which registers current, the flow of electrons. When I push it in, it goes one direction. When I push, pull it out, it goes the other direction. Pretty straightforward. What I've made here is a human 
alternating generator. Now, three things are going on in this simple, simple demonstration. Number one, I'm producing a current in here. You, and you can see that with the galvanometer. The second thing is, what you can't see, is that that current creates its own magnet called an electromagnet. And that electromagnet opposes the original magnet. So when I push this in, it's like two magnets opposing one another. I have to use energy and overcome that force and use energy to do this. There's a famous saying in physics, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Here's a classic example. You have to use energy to create electricity. That tuna fish salad sandwich I ate three days ago ultimately ends up as current, is what happens. Now most current, now most current is produced not by some person pushing a magnet in and out of a coil, but they use some other form of energy, whether it be gas or coil or nuclear power, air, water, whatever it might be, and they turn a generator then. And that's how most of our current is produced. By the way, speaking of, of copper, uh, <coughs> excuse me, speaking of copper atoms, did you hear about the two copper atoms that we're talking? And the one said, I think I lost an electron. The other one said, are you certain? And the first one said, yes, I'm positive. <laughs> Would you like to see that demonstrated on another apparatus here? Yeah. Okay, so what do, I, what do you think I have here? It looks like a gu guillotine, right? But it really isn't. It's the University of Wisconsin Physics Department's very own vegetable chopper. <laughs> and if you order within 30 minutes after the end of the show, free shipping is included. <laughs> so would you like to see that work? Yeah. Okay, you like the face on there? Kind of looks like that famous painting, The Scream. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at it. Let me take this. I have a copper blade here, as you can see. I'm going to lift it up. I'm going to put the carrot in here like so. Lift it up. I have a trip mechanism up here on the top. And are you ready? Three, two, one. Hmm. Hmm. As you can see, it chopped it very, very readily. Alas, poor Yorick, I knew him well. <laughs> I, okay, this is not the physics version of Hamlet, so I guess we won't go on with that then. Okay, you want to see it again with a variation? Yeah. Okay, this time I'm going to take a large set of magnets, like we talked about over here. Okay, and I'm going to put them right at the base Where the, where the blade comes down. All right. Let me lift this up again. Make sure they're in place. Take another carrot. Put in here. Like so. And try it again. You ready? Three, two, one. Hardly dented it. A little bit of a surface scratch on this, but hardly dented it. How is that possible? Well, again, let's go back to our three principles. The blade came down, it hit the magnets here, which created a current in the blade. That current created a, another magnet, which opposed the original magnet and basically slowed down the blade. And the carrot was saved. Now, if this was an actual guillotine back in the 1700s during the French Revolution. All Marie Antoinette would have had to do was what? Put a large bank of magnets on the back of her neck and she would have been? Fine. Fine. Physics saves lives. <laughs> hmm. Do you like my coat, by the way? I, I had a different coat, um, but it was collecting a lot of static electricity, like they talked about earlier there. So I sent it back and they sent me a new one free of charge. <laughs> Okay, I'm now going to need a little hot water. I'm going to need a little hot water in just a moment. So let me take this paper cup, start this Bunsen burner.
pour some water in just a regular coffee paper cup, like so. Oh, I spilled a little. I'll, I'll clean that up later. Okay. Just um, a little in there. And put the paper cup on the Bunsen burner. I'll keep an eye on that for a few minutes while I go into my next demonstration here. I'll get back to that in just a moment. I need a young volunteer to come down to help me with another demonstration. You right there, yes. Hmm. 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 Okay, and your name is? Sandri. What? Sandri. Sandri? Mm -hmm. Okay, Sandri, here, here's what we're going to do, Sandri. We're going to have a race. I want you to take that metal ball right there, okay, in just a moment. And I will take this metal ball right here, okay? Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do on the count of one, two, three, go, we're going to drop the balls through these copper tubes. You want to look down each tube and make sure there's nothing in either tube? Nothing. And you want to look on this one, make sure there's nothing there? Nothing. Nothing there. Okay, Sandri. All right, so when I say one, two, three, put your hand down here, yeah, a few inches below. When I say one, two, three, go, we'll drop the balls. One, two, three, go. <laughs> wow, she smoked me, didn't she, huh? I mean, just, wasn't even close. How is that possible? Is her gravity different here than here? No. Here's the difference. Her ball was simply a stainless steel ball. My ball, on the other hand, what do you think? A magnet. And as my ball went through the copper tube, what are the three things happen? It creates a current. That current creates an opposite magnet that what? Slows the ball down, and it takes several seconds to go through. All right, Sandra, appreciate it. Let's give her a big hand for helping me out. OK, let me get back to my cup here now. <laughs> It's been on here for a couple of minutes, as you can see. Um, eh, it's getting close to a boil. There's a little steam in there. Let me dump the water out. And you can take a look at it. And you're going, wow. I mean, I saw some looks on some faces when I first put that on there, going like, he's putting a paper cup on a Bunsen burner. If you look at the bottom, it's completely fine, OK? Two physics principles are taking place here. Number one, for me to heat to get the heat from that flame, I need a very thin bottom. If this was a thick piece of cardboard, it wouldn't work. The cardboard would start on fire. But the thinner it is, the better. It's kind of like your home at home in the wintertime here in Madison. If you have a thin wall, you're going to conduct a lot of heat to the outside. If you have a thicker wall with lots of insulation, you won't conduct the heat. Here I need something very thin. Second thing, and equally important, in fact, probably more important, is I need some substance inside here to absorb that heat. Heat's a form of energy. I picked water. Why did I pick water? Because it has a very high, what we call, heat capacity, or specific heat. And that means it can absorb a lot of heat into itself without raising much in temperature. So the heat from that flame was conducted through to the bottom into the water. Some of the water may have started boiling. That's another heat absorbing process called heat of vaporization, when the water goes from a liquid into a gas. All of those added to the fact that the bottom of the cup never hit its kindling point and never started on fire. Now, as you can see here, though, you say, wait a minute, there is some char around here, right? What burned? It's the lip. And why did the lip burn? It's thicker, and it's not in contact with the water. So that, so that burned then. Okay. <laughs> now, I did make a mess here. And before I go, let, let, let me clean up my mess. Um, does anyone have a, like a handkerchief or something? A handkerchief. Ah, and, and your name is? Lore. What? Lore. Lore? OK, Lore, thank you. Can I, can I use this to clean? Yeah, OK, thank you. Let me clean that up a little bit. Now, here. Well, now it's a little dirty. Um, let me wash it off for you, okay? Okay. Wash it in this solution in here, okay? This cleaning solution, like so. And now I'm sorry, Laura, but now it's really wet. Uh, sorry about that. But here, here's here's what we'll do, Laura. Let me take this and put this tongs on here like this, and then let me heat this up a little bit. See if we can't dry it off. All right. No. 
Oh, oh my good. Oh, uh, Professor. Oh, can you? Oh my goodness. Can you say? Oh, I, I ruined it. I think I ruined your hanker. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. <laughs> How is that possible? How could I do that? <clears throat> well, a couple of physics principles again that we've talked about already. <clears throat> that solution was 50% water and 50% alcohol. So when I washed it in the alcohol, some of the alcohol turned into a vapor. Remember we said heat of vaporization? That's what started on fire. Then the heat from the fire went into turning the rest of the alcohol into vapor taking heat away from the, 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 the handkerchief, and there's also 50% water here. So the water started heating up, raising in temperature. Some of it started going into a vapor, and all of those things added to the fact that the handkerchief would not start on fire and never got to its, its kindling point. So, so as you can see, thank, uh, thank you, Laura, for, for helping me out. Okay, let's give her a big hand, in fact. Okay. <laughs> So as you can see, Professor Erickson, my demonstrations are the best and I'm the one that should be hired, right? Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Craney, your demonstrations were outstanding and your jokes were very corny. <laughs> I, okay, okay, but I understand that you put a big metal door knocker in the front door of your house recently, is that true? Yes. Okay. I, you're trying to win the Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm out of here. I'm gone. All right. You know, Professor Sprott had a few corny jokes himself over the years, and I don't think we can have any more of that. When you dance, you do use your feet, and it's a great way to build up heat. And I think that's pretty neat. Don't you agree, Mr. Pete? Oh. Congratulations, Professor Sprott. Uh, as a poet, you're smoking hot. You know, I did meet someone who was studying heat. Who's that, Mr. Pete? Let's get ready to rumble. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, put your hands together for the next host of the Wonders of Physics show, Sam Braden and Owen. Thank you. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. What is going on here? Well, what does it look like? We're grad students and we're auditioning for Professor Sprott's job. <laughs> Aren't you a little young to be interviewing for Professor Sprott's job? <laughs> look, just because we didn't go to school with Isaac Newton like you did, <laughs> doesn't mean we aren't qualified for the job. Everyone who's auditioned so far looks like they knew Galileo personally. <laughs> anyway, we think it's high time that there are some fresh faces and fun ideas around here. The wonders of physics need to be explosive, energetic, and in your face. OK, let's see what you've got. Perfect. All right. So for our first demonstration, I'm going to need a volunteer, someone who hasn't volunteered already. Let's see, tie-dye right in the middle there. Come on down. Let's give our volunteer a big round of applause. Perfect. So our first demo today is going to be a vortex cannon. All right, so what's your name? Ollie. Ollie, nice to meet you. What you're going to do is you're just going to hit this like a drum like that. Perfect. Is that it? Thank you, thank you. Is that it? Hold your horses, we're getting okay. there. Okay. This is a vortex cannon, it is working. We just can't see the vortices. So what I'm going to do is fill it up with a little smoke and we'll try it again. All right, hit it again. Nice, do another Ooh. one. Rapid fire. <laughs> There we go. Very good. Big round of applause. Very good. You know, can we do it bigger, though? We can do it bigger, guys. So let's try this one, perhaps. Ooh. All right. I'm going to fill it up with smoke. Try it again. Ooh, look at that. OK. Maybe a little softer, see if we can get it slower. There we go. Look at that. Do a few more. Yeah, very good. Nice job. Big round of applause. So the way this vortex cannon is working is we're just forcing air out through the hole in the, uh, in the front here. Now the air that goes through the middle is traveling faster than the air that goes around the edge because it gets slowed down as it scrapes up against it. 
So you get this nice little ring where all the smoke gets trapped, and we get this li nice little effect here. Now, you can make either of these things at home. You could make this one with a red Solo cup, and this is just an oatmeal container, either of which you could find at your local grocery store or frat house. <laughs> you know, maybe I'm being a little picky, but can we even do it bigger? We can do it bigger, guys. Wonderful. What if we tried this one? All right, so I have a volunteer here in the second row. It's time to put that cup on your head. Just stay right there and balance it on your head, okay? All right, so let's see if I can knock this off your head, all right? Ready? Three, two, one. Oh, a little slow. Let's see. There we go. That was a lot better. But I think we can do even better. You think we can do it better? I do think you guys so. think we can do it better than that? Yeah. yeah. What if we try this one? All right. Here we go. Oops. All right. Put it back on your head. We're going to try it first, OK? You ready? Three, two, one. Oh. This side. There we go. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can get some smoke rings now, if it wants to cooperate with me. Uh, not Just many a little bit. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see if we can get a smoke ring, but maybe we'll need to, do, to try something else. Ooh, a little bit, not too much. Hmm. You know, what if instead of using smoke, we use fire? Yeah. You guys want to do fire? I don't like this so too. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah. OK. So instead of using smoke this time, we're going to fill up the trash can with butane. Butane is a flammable gas. So don't try this at home. And I'm just going to launch it right at this nice little ring of fire here. So are we ready? All right, let's see if we can do it. Three, two, one. Look at that. That's better. Very cool. Well, that was really very good. Thank you. But I sort of thought it would be more in your face. Oh, we can get in your face. I'll need a volunteer, preferably someone tall with bad reflexes. <laughs> Any takers? Let's see here. Ooh, back corner over there, Braden. Braden. Back corner? Back corner, right back there. Back corner? All right, you up there in the back corner. Ooh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, come on down. Let's give a round of applause for a volunteer. <laughs> now, as our volunteer is making their way down, I just want to take a moment to say I love bowling. Does anyone else who love bowling? No. Yeah? Yeah? OK. Nice, nice. And what is your name? Stella. Stella, do you like bowling? Yeah, a little bit. Well, would you like to go bowling today? Sure? Huh, OK. I'll have you follow Professor Erickson over to that stool over there if you would. And today, this you can is going to be top. our bowling ball. 18 pounds suspended from the ceiling by this little wire here, making what oh, we in the business call down. a pendulum. I'm sorry, I didn't speak loudly. Now, yes. thank you. Stella, do you have dental insurance? <laughs> you don't know? Um, that, that's fine. Um, how much do you like your teeth? A lot? OK, well, we'll try to keep those in, right? So what I'm going to have you do, I'm going to have you hold this ball. Maybe, maybe we'll take the glasses off. Yeah, that might be good. Could you take your glasses off? Thank you. Doing absolutely wonderful. Now go ahead and hold this, bring it close to your face, it'll be perfectly fine. Now when I tell you, I'll have you just let go, right? Don't push it, just let it go, all right? Maybe a little closer to the face. A little closer, okay, there we go. Good eye. Are we all ready? Yeah! All right, three, two, one, let go. Now don't put your hands down and don't lean forward, okay? And here we go. Oh, one more time. Let's give a round of applause to a great volunteer. Now what happens nice is job. objects have a tendency to be lazy, just like me on a Sunday. So objects have a tendency to want the minimum amount of energy possible. When the ball is here, it doesn't want to move. 
But when I bring it up off the ground, gravity wants to pull it back down, giving it gravitational potential energy. It has the potential to move. When Stella let go, the ball started getting kinetic energy. It started moving. It went down, came back up, and then back and down and around again. But the key to note is that due to something we call the well, conservation of energy, the ball never goes higher than its original position because energy is neither created nor destroyed. So Stella was never in any mortal peril. <laughs> you know, I was reading a book the other day about anti-gravity. I could not put it down. Uh. <laughs> All right, we have one more demonstration for you guys today. And we decided that we need to bring a little energy into this room. <laughs> well, don't be shocked when we don't get this job. Come on, let's be a little more like a proton and be positive, OK? <laughs> So Nikola Tesla was a young, brilliant physicist who showed that we can transfer energy through the air without the need for wires. So we're going to do a demonstration here to show just that. And in order to do so, we're going to use this million volt Tesla coil over here. Ooh. And what we're going to do is see if we can light up this fluorescent light bulb without the need for wires. So can I have you hold this? Stay seated and hold this. Awesome. All right. So, I'm going to turn this million volt Tesla coil in a little bit, and just a fair warning, it is a little bit loud. So you might want to cover your ears. All right, are we ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. That was in your face and impressive, I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. However, lighting up children with a million volts, <laughs> a butane cannon, pretty cool, and mm. dental insurance. You have to have it. <laughs> I think this was a little bit reckless. Uh, I'm sorry, gentlemen. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, my parents always said I was kinetic. Why is that? Because I have no potential. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, I'm going. Thank you, guys. The Wonders of Physics has a strong tradition of having graduate students in the show, and I think it's going to continue for many years. Our final candidate who will audition today is the physics department's very own Hattie McLean. Hi, everybody! <laughs> Professor Erickson, I am so excited to audition today because what Professor Sprott started 40 years ago is an amazing program, and I'm so happy it's going to continue. I do think, though, however, that I can take what he started and make it even better. So for my audition today, I'm going to start with something big. This cage over here called a Faraday cage. Now, this Faraday cage is basically a box made out of metal that protects anything on the inside from electric fields or electromagnetic radiation on the outside. How, you may wonder? Well, this cage is made of a conducting metal. So when the charge hits it, it goes through the metal and around the outside of the cage, leaving anything on the inside unharmed. Now, for my demonstration of the Faraday cage, I really wanted my audition to stand out. So I brought in a special guest today, someone that you all know. He wears a sweater even in the summer. He's our favorite mascot, Bucky Badger. <laughs> Hello, Bucky. Thank you for coming today. Are you ready for some physics? All right. Bucky's ready for some physics. So your job today, Bucky, very, very easy. All you have to do is sit in this Faraday cage right over here while I turn on the million volt Tesla coil. <laughs> It'll be OK, Bucky. Physics always works. <laughs> oh, Bucky. Oh, uh, you can do it, Bucky. Yes. <laughs> You're shaking. It's okay, Bucky, don't worry. I promise the chancellor that you'll be 100% safe, okay? All right, so come on over here. <laughs> come on, right over here now. You... <laughs> yeah, that's good, Bucky. Duck your head a little bit to go in. <laughs> All right, you just have to sit on that chair. It looks like an electric chair. But don't worry, I didn't plug it in. I didn't plug it in, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, now just two rules for you, Bucky. Stay seated during the demonstration, 
and keep your paws on the inside of the cage, okay? Yes, you got it? All right, all right. So I'm just gonna head over here and turn on the motor for the million volt Tesla coil. Now you've heard this before, so remember, if you don't like loud noises, cover your ears, and you just stay seated. <laughs> all right, now to turn up the high frequency. Okay, though. Are you all right, Bucky? Oh, oh no! Oh, oh, no. Everyone give Bucky a round of applause. <laughs> all right. See, Bucky? It's physics. It always works. Come on over here. Now, that Faraday cage may seem really weird, right? But I have a question for you. Have you ever been in a car? Yes. Yes, you're driving. Raise your hand if you've ever been in a car. Oh, almost everybody. All right. Well, you know what? If you've been in a car, you've been inside a Faraday cage before. The metal frame of the car protects you from a big electric charge, let's say a lightning strike. If you've ever been in an airplane, you've also been in a Faraday cage. The aluminum hull protects you from any lightning strikes. Now, Bucky, the cool thing about Faraday cages is, though, that the blocking works two ways. So if we create any electromagnetic radiation inside the cage, it won't escape. Do you want to see that happen? Yeah, you do. All right, all right. So this one is for everyone to participate in. If you have a cell phone, pull it out. All right, Bucky, you can use mine, all right? <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's gonna, I don't think that's gonna work for you, Bucky. You can use my cell phone. Now, parents. Parents, take note of this, because if you've ever wanted your kids to get off screens, you can use this very science to do that for you. No yelling needed, okay? So, pull out your phone and go to the Wi-Fi and look for the router for this room. Now, our router is called CH space 2103. Uh, Bucky, I'll pull it up for you on this one. Now, see, it's right there. Now, you don't need to connect to it because it's password protected. Bucky knows the password, but we all know he's not talking. No, so just be able to see that router visible on your phone. All right, you got that, Bucky? All right, stay there. Keep your eye on that router. Now, I'm going to go over here. Here's the actual router in the room, this black box. Now, parents, if you want to block the Wi-Fi signal, just make your very own Faraday cage. This is just a plastic bin, plastic storage bin that I've covered inside and out with tin foil. And this is how it works. Simply put the router inside, put the cover on the box. I'm gonna use a, a heavy weight on top just to make sure that there's a good connection on all sides of the top. Now, if you wanna recycle your Wi-Fi, just turn it off and turn it back on again. How those fingers work on that touch screen buggy. <laughs> no, okay, let me do it for you. All right. So, and if you bring the Wi-Fi back up, you'll notice for most of the room, the router does not appear. We've essentially blocked the signal. Now, there may be a few people really close to the router that are getting a very weak signal, but for most of the room, you probably can't see it. Can you see it on your phone? No, you can, you're pretty close, right? All right, so parents, next time you want kids off the screens, just block the Wi-Fi signal, and you don't even have to tell them. They'll, they'll turn it off. I can't, however, do anything about that unlimited data plan that you pay for. Thank you, Bucky. <laughs> All right. Well, Bucky, I want to thank you for coming and doing physics with me today. I know that you're a busy mascot, so I'll see you at the next game. Yeah, you got to go. All right. Thank you, Bucky. <laughs>
I want to get the tablecloth out from under the glass and the plate. But I'm feeling lazy today, so I'm not going to touch the dishes. I'm going to use physics to do that. Now, the cool thing about inertia is that the more mass an object has, the more inertia it has. So you can think of that as an object is heavier, it's a little tougher to move, right? So more mass equals more inertia, and the fact that an object wants to continue doing what it's really doing. So, hey, Professor Erickson, what are you doing? Well, Hattie, I heard you say more mass, more inertia. I'm just trying to be helpful. That's right, I did say those very words. You're right, I did. So, okay, so Professor Erickson put on another plate and another cup. It's pretty high, but he's right, I can do this. Can you please promise me no more glasses, okay? This no is No more glasses. Okay, good. So, more mass equals more inertia. So, I really, really should be able to do this because I have all of that water and two plates now and two cups. So, what is happening here? Whoa, 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 whoa. Professor Erickson, you said no more glasses. No more glasses. Just one goblet. One goblet, <laughs> all right. Okay, so now three level. Thank you very much. I've learned my lesson to not ever turn my back on you. <laughs> now, let's take out the tablecloth, all right? Only putting force on the tablecloth, not in the dishes. Count me down from three. Three, two, one. Yeah. So, it works because I only put a force on the tablecloth and not on any of those dishes. Now kids, you can try this at home with your parents' permission, but you know, instead of doing that at your house, why don't you just do it at your friend's house instead? <laughs> there. Now for my next demonstration today, this is one of my favorites because it allows me to highlight some of the amazing research that we're doing right here in Chamberlain Hall. We research all sorts of things, but sometimes in the process of doing that research, we break glass. Sometimes we break a lot of glass. So we thought, what better way than instead of throwing that glass away, what if we could come up with something that puts the broken glass back together? We could reuse it and not have to buy all of this glass. So we teamed up with the chemistry department and developed this substance right here. We think it's pretty good. Let me show you how it works. Here's a glass beaker. And we'll just pretend that right now, I'm gonna do some research. Oh, yep, that was definitely not good because now I have that. I have a brand new beaker that is broken. But here's how it works. Now, we just put all the glass very carefully into the solution. All right, we good? Now, safety first, let's put on a glove since we're dealing with broken glass. Let's get it all into the solution. Now, I just need to stir this around just a couple times. Let's see if I can get it out of here. Oh, I think it's working. Oh, almost, almost. There's a big hole in the bottom. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, well, because look at what I have here. I didn't put all the glass in. Here's a little tiny piece of broken glass. Let's put that back in. We'll stir it up a little bit. The cool thing about this is it works really fast. Ow. And there's the beaker. I oh, we're pretty excited about this. We looked into getting a patent on this, but we realized someone beat us to it. It's vegetable oil, less than vegetable oil to be exact. And this is a demonstration on index of refraction. So it just goes to show you, if you think something's too good to be true, it probably is. Now let me tell you what's happening here. When light hits a substance, it's bent at a certain angle. Well, it turns out that when light hits vegetable oil and Pyrex glass, it's bent at the exact same angle. So when I put my beaker into the oil, it just disappears when it fills up with oil. Now, if I were to put the beaker into the oil and keep air inside of the beaker, you can still see it because the light is going through the oil and the glass and back into the air. It's not until it's filled up with oil that it completely disappears. So what you don't know is that 
the whole time that you guys were in here, I had not one, but two beakers hiding in this tub of oil, okay? And now I have a lot of broken glass in there as well. <laughs> so that's index of refraction. <laughs> For my final demonstration, I wanted to end my audition with a bang. So I brought the UW ping pong cannon with me today, okay? It does one thing and one thing only. It shoots ping pong balls. It's this big, long tube that you see taking up the entire space of the desk. Let's move this back. Here's our ping pong ball. It's orange. Now, this tube is hooked up to a vacuum pump and sealed on both ends with tape. Professor Erickson, I'm going to need your help with this in just a second. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to seal up the end of this tube with some tape, like I said. And it doesn't have to be pretty, but I just have to make sure that there aren't any air bubbles in the tape on this end. All right, I think that's good. Would you like to start the vacuum pump? Perfect, so the ball rolls to the end. So now what's happening is the air in that tube is being taken out. So eventually, we'll end up with zero air pressure inside the tube compared to all of the air pressure outside. All of this air that we're walking around in is like an ocean of air, and we're on the bottom. It pushes at us on all sides with a force of about 15 pounds per square inch. Now, it may not seem like a lot, but we can produce some pretty cool effects with that amount of air pressure. How are we looking? Looking good. Okay, so when you turn off the vacuum pump, wait just a second, there's a little pin on that end that he'll push, and that'll pop a hole in the tape, and the air will go rushing into the tube, and it should shoot the ping pong ball out, all right? Now, this can be pretty loud, so if you want to cover your ears, I'm actually on a really loud end here, so I'm going to put some ear protection on as well. Now, Professor Erickson, this is your target right here, okay? This little paddle, all right? All right, I'm ready. Three, two, one. Wow! Nice job! So, not only was that a really fast game of ping pong, but it was the shortest game of ping pong because we ruined the paddle and the ball. The ball is just blasted to smithereens after going through the paddle. Calculated the speed of the ball in the cannon, it's several hundred meters per second, all fueled by the air pressure in this room. So I told you I was going to end my audition with a bang. Thank you very much, Hattie. Those were outstanding demonstrations. However, the Department of Physics has not forgotten that oh, no. last year, you set the curtains on fire with your rocket demonstration. There was that. <laughs> so let's give it a try. Oh. Yeah, that's a very good rocket. Yeah, here's the curtain that I set on fire last year. But Professor Erickson, it's really OK, because we can still use it. It just hides right behind that garbage can, OK? <laughs> now, as I'm sure you've all guessed by now, the Department of Physics is not firing Professor Sprott. In fact, he has been working tirelessly behind the scenes for the last several years to put the wonders of physics on very strong footing going forward. I'm very pleased to announce today that Hattie McLean will be leading the wonders of physics moving forward. But you may still see Professor Sprott performing demonstrations in future years. And in fact, he's here today to perform one last demonstration for you. Professor Sprott. Welcome to the wonders of physics. Now, when I did the first one of these shows 40 years ago, I never imagined that we would still be doing it 40 years later. But seeing your smiles and your enthusiasm has been the high point of my life, year after year after year. But all good things must come to an end. And at 80 years old, I feel like it's the right time to 
put the program in the hands of the younger generation, something some of our politicians might consider. <laughs> and so I'm delighted that in the future, the Wonders of Physics annual show will be under the capable direction of Hattie McLean. <laughs> as well as those that she'll recruit to help with the program. Hattie, I'd like to shake your hand and wish you the very best. And now I'd like to do one last demonstration. For 40 years, at the end of every show, I have made a cloud. And so for the 340th and last time, I'd like to make a cloud for you today. Hattie, you know a lot about clouds. Maybe you could help me. I'd love to. Here we have a container with 25 liters of liquid nitrogen, very cold liquid. We force nitrogen gas into the container. That forces the liquid up into this pipe on the top that has several dozen small holes. The liquid nitrogen comes out of those holes, still very, very cold. It comes in contact with the air, and it causes the water vapor in the air to condense into tiny droplets of liquid water. And that's what we call a cloud. And so with that, I'll put on my hat, and thank you all for coming, and thank you for 40 years of the wonders of physics. Professor Sprott has asked me to find someone to entertain you before he arrives. So I have gone over to the zoo and I have found a great storyteller to come out. So please Quack. welcome Reed Miller. Quack, 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 quack. Peter, who's on first? Oh, yes. Who's on first? What's on second? And I don't know who's on third. But you know, enough about baseball. We did that last year. Well, I have found a dancing scientist who recently appeared on America's Got Talent. Please give a welcome for Jeffrey Vinicor. Don't you agree, Mr. Pete? Well, congratulations, Professor Sprott. As a poet, you're smoking hot. You know, I did meet someone who was studying heat. Who's that, Mr. Pete? Well, it's a scientist from the Madison Area Science Technology. Please give a warm welcome for George the Big Bang Boomer. Professor Sprout, I see you've been busy painting over there throughout the show. Well, I have. Would you like to see what I've done? Oh, uh, yeah. I think we'd all like to see it. Well, I've been working on something that illustrates both physics and art. Uh, I don't see anything. Do you? 